Welcome, welcome, welcome to everyone at home. Welcome to our panelists. Um, good evening, uh, good evening. Hello, Magdalena, John, Joe, Veronica, Marcelo, Laura. Hello to our live audience. Um, welcome to our September 11th event, Canada and the Coup in Chile. 50 years later, uh, it's a book launch for Canada Chile Solidarity 1973 to 1990, Testimonies of Civil Society Activism. Uh, which is coming out this month. I'll be posting a link to that in the chat so that you can get your pre-ordered copy. Um, I'm so pleased to be joined by six of the book's uh, authors today. Marcelo Puente, John W. Foster, Magdalena Ugarte, Joe Gunn, Laura McDonald, and Veronica Shield. Um, it's also so great to see people joining us in such good numbers. That's very encouraging. Um, my name is Bianca Magenni. I'm with the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute. Um, we're the organizers of today's discussion, book launch. i um, talking to you from Montreal, or Jojage, which is on the territory of the Ganyenge Haga people. Um, like I said, I will be putting a link to the book in the chat, Canada, Chile, Solidarity, 1973 to 1990, and a huge congratulation to the authors um, for this important contribution. So in terms of today's event, uh, after hearing from our panelists, we're going to have a brief Q&A. So please do put any questions that you have in the Q&A box. The chat uh, is open, so please do um, say hi, let us know when you're where you're tuning in from. Uh, probably goes without saying, but please do keep your comments uh, civil um, and free from uh, any harmful commentary and uh, wherever possible relevant to the, the topic at hand. So for today's event, um, as many of you know, this is the, um, the first 9-11 and September 11 marks 50 years since the U.S. backed uh, General Augusto Pinochet overthrew the democratically elected socialist president Salvador Allende in Chile in the 1973 military coup d'etat. And uh, we picked this important date um, to host the launch of a new book, um, Canada and Chile Solidarity, 1973 to 1990. Um, again, a big congratulations to the authors. It come, it's comes out this month. Um, and the events of 50 years ago had uh, a profound effect on many of those who are speaking here tonight, uh, many of you who are in the Zoom, um, in Chile, in Latin America, and much of the world. Uh, the contrast between um, Allende's democratic socialist and anti-imperialist policies versus Pinochet's uh, repressive, neoliberal, and, and pro-Washington policies was stark. And uh, it's really important for us here to understand the various facets of Canada's role in, in all of this. Um, and as one of the authors, um, Carmen Aguirre noted in last week's Globe, Globe and Mail, um, open quote, Pierre Trudeau expressed diplomatic support for Mr. Pinochet. Within a month of the coup, Canada voted for the Inter-American Development Bank loans to Chile, endorsed the International Monetary Fund loans. And by 1978, Canadian banks had given 20 loans to Chile and direct investments by Canadian companies were at almost a billion dollars. Um, and this had come after um, policies uh, in the opposite for Allende. And in little known history, immediately after the coup, the Canadian ambassador actually cabled um, saying reprisals and searches have created panic atmosphere affecting particularly expatriates, including the riffraff of the Latin American left to whom Allende gave asylum. The country has been on prolonged political binge under the elected IND government, and the junta has assumed the probably thankless task of sobering Chile up, it said in the cable. So given all this, um, and this is something that Carmen asks in her piece uh, in the Globe, why and how did Canada give asylum to almost 7,000 refugees fleeing the dictatorship? So we're going to hear about this and, uh, and much more tonight as the authors discuss their new book, and hopefully we can learn some important lessons as well. So the first speaker of the evening is Laura McDonald. Laura is a professor of political science at the Institute of Political Economy at Carleton University and has published numerous articles and journals and edited collections on the role of NGOs in development, global civil society, social policies, and citizenship struggles in Latin America, Canadian development assistance, Canada-Latin American relations, and the political impact of North American economic integration. Welcome, Laura. Thank you, Bianca. 
Um, and thanks to all the organizers of this event. It's really an honor to be here with this amazing group of authors. I should say that I would, I'm not really an author. I just wrote a preface to the book and I did help, did help a bit with some editing. Um, so I'm sort of speaking uh, first to give some uh, general background and an overview of the book and, and provide my own reaction to the book. Um, I don't, I am not Chilean Canadian and I don't actually remember the coup taking place because I guess I was a bit too young. Um, but I feel like um, I've heard about these events for so long. I've read so much about it, but still I found so much new to learn in this collection of incredible documents. So I'd really like to congratulate uh, Professor Lisa North from York University, who's sort of the godmother of this text. Um, who did a fabulous job in scouring through the documents from the Latin American Research uh, Working Group that was based in Toronto, that formed in uh, partly in response to the events of uh, nineteen of, of the coup, and uh, those documents are now based at the Center for Research on Latin America and the Caribbean at York University, and they're a fabulous source of information for researchers and for this wonderful book. So Lisa helped recruit the authors and, um, and, and got them all to uh, provide introductions to each section of the text, which comprises uh, original primary documents, uh, which are just stunning to read. I, I so enjoyed them, as well as the author's insightful introductions. Uh, I also quickly wanted to mention the work of Cis Levo, who was a librarian at the Latin American Working Group, who helped compile many of these documents and helped me when I was doing research on Canada's role in uh, Central America. And she also helped out a lot with bringing this book together. So these documents bring alive for the reader the tragic and heroic events of this period and help us understand the significance of this coup for broader struggles for democracy and human rights in the hemisphere. As someone who has studied Latin American Canada relations, it's hard to underestimate the importance of the Chilean coup in uh, sparking interest among C Canadians in that far away country, as well as in the Latin American region as a whole. The brutal events of the Chilean military coup and their aftermath had repercussions not just in Chile but throughout the hemisphere and the world. This wasn't the first military coup to take place in a Latin American country by any means, but people concerned with human rights and democracy were particularly shocked by these events since Chile was regarded uh, justly as one of the most democratic states in the region at the time and because of the many hopes that, been, that had been uh, encouraged by the democratic policies of the Salvador Allende government. In response to the coup, there were outpourings of grief and solidarity that spread quickly in response. And as a result, we saw the emergence of, um, sorry, I should have said overestimate, not underestimate, thank you, uh, listener. Um, uh, that we saw new forms of uh, solidarity between Canada and, and Chile and Canada and other Latin American countries uh, forming in response. So as we see in this text, the coup also changed forever relations between Canadians and Chileans, two countries at extreme ends of the Western Hemisphere, who at the time had little contact with each other beyond a select few people. Uh, the documents reveal vi vividly both, both corporate and political complicity on the part of Canadians uh, in the events that uh, transpired there. And uh, these, uh, these events also created new precedents for Canadian refugee policy that are still important today. So uh, we also learn about new and expected, unexpected aspects of Canadians' responses to the coup. Uh, we hear poignant and inspiring testimonies from Chilean Canadians about how these events changed their lives together and how they faced hardships, but also found new forms of community and belonging in Canada. Can Chilean Canadians also contributed enormously to their new homeland. Sorry, I'm tearing up here. Um, I personally um, 
uh, benefited greatly from one particular Chilean Canadian uh, uh, who's uh, now a professor at the Universidad de Santiago, uh, Professor Nain Nomez, who uh, taught me Spanish at the Center for Spanish Speaking People and helped me launch an academic career. So the, the 50th anniversary of the coup is, a, is an appropriate moment to reflect on what we've learned from these episodes and how uh, relations between our countries have changed in intervening years. Much has changed, but much remains the same. Chile is now a thriving democracy, though it still faces many challenges um, that the current government is confronting. And interestingly, the Canadian and Chilean governments are now collaborating and communicating with each other about how to develop a feminist foreign policy and setting new precedents uh, for other Latin American and, and uh, American countries, countries of the Americas that way. Um, some of the organizations uh, discussed in the volume, like the Latin American Working Group no longer exist. Um, but Canadian corporations continue to uh, run rampant in many ways through Chile and other parts of the region and are associated with serious human rights abuses there, particularly in the mining sector. And Indigenous peoples in Canada and Chile, as is discussed in this text, are also working together and, and face common challenges. So when listening to the presentations today, and hopefully when you read the book, I urge you to think about what forms of solidarity still exist between Canadians and Latin Americans fighting oppression and constructing democracy. What can we do together to build more just societies, to build more democratic and uh, accountable international institutions? What new forms of connection are being forged in the era of the internet and social media? This book provides invaluable information and reflections on what these early moments in the relationship between Canada and Latin America mean for our shared futures. So congratulations to all the authors and thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura, for that, uh, that overview. Um, the reactions in Canada after the coup, the solidarity, um, also the complicity, um, and uh, the moving stories of uh, Chilean communities in Canada. And I also wanna echo your gratitude um, to Lisa North for her role and also um, to Lisa for helping put together um, this, uh, help to put together this panel um, event today. And I'm uh, looking very forward to hearing more from you in the Q&A and hopefully re reflecting on some of the questions that you posed, posed for us. So our next speaker is John W. Foster. John teaches in the International Studies and Human Justice Programs at the University of Regina, who's a founder of the Latin American Working Group in 1965, headed the Chile Welcome Committee and the Interchurch Committee for Human Rights in Chile that were formed immediately after the September 1973 coup, played a leading role in its successor organization, who's also National Secretary of Oxfam Canada for seven years and an officer of the United Church of Canada for 18 years. Welcome, John. I think you're gonna to have to unmute, unmute yourself there, John. Yeah, perfect. That's that. Hi, it's everyone. It's, it's wonderful to be with you all and also these dozens and dozens, scores and scores of people online this evening. There are many voices in this book and um, the one that sticks out for me verbally and audio-wise, is the voice of Flesh Snow Chacon on As It Happens, hours after the coup, with um, gunfire in her neighborhood in the background. That, for me, marked the day, the hour, and the tragedy that was unfolding. 1973 was Cold War, often referred to these days often with China or some other place in mind, but it was very much in mind in dialogue with the Canadian officials and um, internationally. It was the era of Nixon and Kissinger, reminded this week that Kissinger is still alive. There's God. 
an era of American training and orientation of military forces throughout the hemisphere of uh, money and uh, influence and of the CIA and its personnel. It was um, the, the military were already in power in Brazil, soon to be in Uruguay, and not long after the Chilean coup, as well. Each other, and um, of course, following the Cuban revolution, with the sympathy, gun sites were aimed at Havana. John, um, I'm not sure if this is for everybody, but your your internet is quite, it seems a little bit shaky right now. So just letting you know if that continues. The to internet, happen. oh really? Oh. You oh. need to switch off your camera if that continues, but just letting you know. Uh, it says participant has in, enabled closed captioning. Perhaps there's something I should disable. Oh, no, no, you're good. I'm just letting you know if it continues. Oh, okay. Like, we, oh, I might have to ask you to switch off your camera just so that we can hear you a bit better, but uh, please continue. Okay, I may be fading. So uh, an important aspect of the international context was that Canada in 1956 uh, accepted more than 30,000 refugees from Hungary responding to basically the crushing of an incipient revolution in Hungary. And again, in 68, responding to the crushing and fading of the Prague Spring uh, in Slovakia. And again, 12,000 refugees coming to Canada. Canada had never accepted refugees, um, knowingly in any case, from a socialist or left-wing state. And so that's an important aspect of the Cold War to keep in mind because it affected many attitudes. The section I introduce deals with a very specific part of political pressure in Canada relating to the situation in Chile and primarily dealing with the possibility of refugee help uh, to them. It, focuses on the role of a number of Christian denominations, religious orders, and uh, friends in assembling pressure on the Canadian government in a humanitarian fashion and in with sister organizations in Chile itself. I was a staff researcher for the United Church of Canada, and that provided me with an entree to uh, watch and uh, record uh, four successive uh, uh, interviews, uh, advocacy meetings with Canadian cabinet ministers, two foreign ministers and the Minister of Immigration. The first one of those occurred in, in uh, October of 1993, on October the 8th. Honorable Mitchell Sharp, who was Minister of uh, External Affairs, Government of Pierre Elliott Trudeau. It was not a friendly meeting. This, it had elements of tension and uh, charge and countercharge in a sense. Mr. Sharp accused the church leaders who were there present to communist or other left wing propaganda to mistaken estimates of what was happening in the streets of Chile and uh, to assure that high level contacts of that was were normalizing. We understood, of course, that the situation was in no sense normal and we were aware of from friends Many others in Chile, streets, in the stadiums, in uh, various schools and universities, and uh, Tionez as well. The period from 
existing until roughly the end of November was a period of information war. Basically downplaying reports of humanitarian disaster from Chile, and others, reporters, fact finders, and so on, visiting Chile, in touch with friends, relatives, and encountering the Hold government. On, John, I'm going to have to interrupt you for a moment. Your internet is really choppy right now. Can I just ask you to switch off your camera? Um, we'll probably be able to hear you a little bit better. And I'll just monitor your internet. I can kind of see how it's doing, and I'll let you know um, when you can switch your camera back on. All right, go ahead. Is that all right? Perfect. Okay, from uh, September for two months was basically an information war in Canada. There were reports, as you'll see in the book, in the press, some quite insightful ones by reporters like Ian Adams. There was testimony from uh, others. And on the other hand, the government was uh, basically ignoring those facts, those testimonies, and arguing that the situation would, uh, as I said, normalize. They also constantly said that the military would give up, that, that centrist or some sort of combination of political parties would be restored and, uh, and Chile would be back uh, to normal. The moment of change really is marked in November with the release of the cables from the Canadian ambassador. And it, it's quote, the quotation of those documents in the House of Commons and the uh, fixation of the government in trying to find how they have become public and ultimately uh, trapping and uh, firing Bob Thompson, who had a federal civil servant who had released them. Those um, cables and the embarrassment about them led the government to a thought. And a diplomat, for a son of a former prime minister, Jeff Pearson, on a quick visit to Santiago to assess the situation. He came back to Canada, met with a committee of the cabinet in Ottawa, told them that he thought there were future Canadians in Chile, and uh, they're about to beginning of the thinking uh, in, uh, the, in the Pearson building, named after his father, where uh, simultaneously at that moment, uh, solidarity organizations across the country organized protests of the and government offices. And uh, coincident with that, Allende's widow, Hortensia Busi, Canada, and met the Prime Minister and others. So I think that uh, magic moment, if you like, led to significant change on the inside of the government, although it still had a good way to go. As a result of that, when we met with Mr. Uh, Mr. Sharp, It was clear that something was afoot, and in fact, in January, a first group of, uh, of refugees from Chile would arrive in Canada, primarily people who had been resident for weeks and months uh, in a... Um, that 10,000 dedications came into the embassy in the, period, in the first couple of months of 1974, putting to rest uh, the, the slow of the Canadian officials, which was frequently Chileans don't come to Canada. The following months saw continued pressure and advocacy primarily around issues of how many or what numbers of people Canada could assist against the prominence of security checks by members of the Canadian police on applicants and for uh, 
refuge for other Latin American refugees who had been caught in the Chilean tragedy and who had been welcomed to Chile under Allende. The church has utilized allies in the UN, in the World Council of Churches, and uh, in sister bodies in Chile, originally the Comité Pro Paz, then the Vicariate of Solidarity, and new organizations established to assist pr uh, prospective ref refugees. Of the file, month after month with the government, however recent, still moving slowly toward a special fortune. In October, one year after the original meeting with the new foreign minister, Alan McKechn, and Mr. Andrew was known as um, a broad alliance of churches, unions, academics, and allies in a meeting which church attendees quietly termed a victory. Ultimately, it has been mentioned uh, several thousand, some would say as many as 27,000, but certainly 7,000, the official estimate of refugees would be brought to Canada uh, in the coming years. Uh, there are a couple of stories I could tell about this in particular, one dealing with a special initiative which really needs to have attention, which brought 200 political prisoners carefully selected to Canada, and another to answer the question about non-Chilean refugees from Chile. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, John. Thank you for that political con context um, and for the insight into the inner machinations of the government um, and other fascinating insights, and also for your tremendous uh, activism and solidarity and the documentation um, of all of this. So it's uh, I'm looking very forward to hearing more from you in the Q&A. Also very excited about how many of us there are on this call. There's about 150 of us participating in today's event. Very encouraging to see this level of interest uh, and solidarity. Um, so our next speaker of the evening is Joe Gunn. Uh, Joe is the director of Centre Oblat, a voice for justice at St. Saint Paul University. For seven years, he lived in Latin America, working in refugee camps and on development projects. For over 10 years, he developed and coordinated policies for social justice with the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops. He's also the founding vice chair of Kairos, Canadian Ecumenical Justice uh, Initiatives. Joe was an active participant in the Chile Solidarity Movement following the coup d'etat and lived in Chile for over 35 years. Welcome, Joe. Thank you so very much, Bianca. It's uh, wonderful to be here. I'm speaking to you from the unceded, unsurrendered land of the Algonquin people in Ottawa. Uh, so many, it's so lovely to see so many people and uh, names that I know online on the chat and to be with this uh, lovely group of speakers. And again, I'd like to thank the organizers and Lisa and Cease who put the book together. My uh, very, very small uh, contribution to the book was only to write an introduction to the first days of the coup. And so I'll talk to hopefully interest those of you that hadn't seen the book yet in uh, in getting it. Uh, I wish it came accompanied, as I said this evening earlier on, with uh, Marcelo singing Valparaiso Puerto Mio, and we could have a Peña, we could have some uh, Tinto and they really enjoy, but we'll, we'll do what you can. When you read the book, you'll see lots of stories and names of, of times that remember, uh, I remember from way back when I was a, a teenager. Uh, so it's wonderful to be here. What I found interesting about the Chilean experience in Canada was, uh, for example, I work for church organizations and I cannot imagine a time when people like John Foster uh, organized so well that the churches responded three days after the coup by sending a letter from the three largest uh, Christian, Christian churches in Canada uh, to Mitchell Sharp uh, asking him not to recognize the regime 
and to bring people who needed uh, who needed safe to be brought to, uh, carefully to Canada very very quickly. This was done like three days before our trade union colleagues jumped in and others. So the fact that actually of those three signatories of the United Church, the primate of the Anglican Church at the time, the president of the Catholic bishops had actually all been to Chile uh, in those three years of the Allende ex uh, experience of the government shows that there were preparation by people like John Foster and many others who built this relationship with the global south that would appear to be so, so important down the road. It's not that it didn't happen in other uh, other organizations as, as well, but I think that was really, really uh, important to notice at the time. Uh, so what you saw in the solidarity movement uh, very, very quickly that, uh, that grew, uh, you know, when you look in the documents, if you have not read the, the, the first part of the book, for example, I had forgotten that we even had a Canadian, Bob Everton, that was that was held in the stadium, in the national stadium. Uh, there were uh, Canadians who were in Chile. Uh, there were, of course, people that were engaged with them. Uh, John mentioned Flory Chacon as a, as a person who played a great role getting on as it happens and so on. Those were, those were really important moments. And that the visits to uh, Ottawa by uh, church people to immediately try to engage Mitchell Sharp and have uh, to speak about Chile. There are stories about these people being photographed uh, by another floor above them by the RCMP because it was the Cold War and these people were accused of being communist sympathizers and so on and so on. And we heard what Ambassador Ross was saying at the time. So the, it was a very, very stark time. Uh, and what happened was because of the interest of Canadians, these amazing campaigns that took uh, uh, off across the country that will be mentioned. I remember uh, organizing youth groups to go into banks with a whole bunch of pennies because we were upset that Naranda wanted to mine copper in Chile. Uh, we all complained about Canada deciding to send a Havilland aircraft to the to the junta very closely. The, you know the the fact that. Uh, you know, we could we could see Canadian investment going into into Chile very very quickly after the coup. There 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 seemed to be not, uh, a lot of work to be done. And when I lived in Regina shortly after the coup, because of the initial well, fourteen families and then others that came to that town, the the fact that we could help people learn some English and be able to speak to these issues allowed us to go into union halls and church basements and build this. Uh, build this network. Uh, so I don't want to say too much more, except I think the the kind of, uh, you'll see it all in the book, but if I might suggest uh, five points that I think might be relevant to uh, how is it that Canadian civil society managed to respond to the coup, that 9-11 that happened 50 years ago, uh, how is it that we were able to respond so quickly in Canadian civil society. What are some elements of that? I think the first one is that the, the civil society organizations, churches especially, uh, had better information than the government itself. There were about 3,000 missionaries at the time who were Canadian missionaries in different places in Latin America, and they were vociferous in telling us about what the situation was, and they didn't live in the rarefied diplomatic circles that uh, that other, you know, that some of the Canadian uh, reps, of course, did. Uh, we had leadership that was informed and ready to act at that time in trade union movements, in, uh, in churches, and so on. Uh, as I mentioned, some people had actually been to Chile, uh, so that work had gone to prepare them. The ability to organize effectively in church basements, in union halls, in civil society groups, uh, through NGOs, some of the NGOs, uh, a friend today wrote about how the group in saint Agath of uh, organizers in Quebec immediately responded to the canoe very, very strongly. And how that membership got motivated was really, really important. I think it's also important to note that we took on through churches, through unions, through groups like the Task Force and Churches and Corporate Responsibility and others, we took on the Canadian corporate sector that immediately wanted to jump back into Chile, okay? Uh, the banks, 
Naranda Mines, then the eighth largest corporation in Canada. Uh, these were all targets. And of course, that whole movement was really helped when we got uh, Chilean activists in the in the network that could have, explain uh, uh, to all of us uh, Canadians who uh, who needed so much information. And finally, I think it's really important that whether you're church groups, union groups, uh, NGOs, and others, people worked collaboratively. It's not like there weren't political disagreements among the Chileans or the Canadians that worked in these groups. But, you know, overall, the movements succeed when people decide there are things we can do together and there are things that we can uh, that we can bring forward. So I was very, very impressed to see footage uh, last night in Chile uh, of people uh, yelling in Santiago and massive numbers, nunca más, nunca más, never again. And let us all keep working to make that true. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, thank you for that inspiring uh, bit of history and for those important questions, too, um, that you've posed for us to consider about why uh, solidarity groups in Canada were able to respond so quickly, so effectively, what can we learn from this. Um, it's truly inspiring to hear about the movement that emerged and the collaboration. Uh, movements can indeed succeed. Um, I look forward to hearing more from you in the Q&A. The next speaker of the evening is Marcelo Puente. Uh, Marcelo is a Chilean Canadian singer, songwriter and poet, as well as a soloist and collaborator with Canadian and Chilean artists. His songs are part of the Canadian National Archive, Canada-Chile Solidarity uh, Night uh, of Immigrant Songs, rather. He's performed across the world, recorded seven records, published poetry in an, anth an anthology of Latin American poets in Canada. Marcelo was nominated for a Dora Mavor Moore Award and received the Somos Award and Porcupine Award for his music um, and enshrining Latin American music. He's part of the team that wrote the book Chileans in Toronto, Memories of Exile. Welcome, Marcelo. Well, hello everyone. I'm very pleased to be here, eh? really pleased to be very happy. And I'm going to talk, that's funny, I just realized that from the other side, from the Chilean side, and I have to tell you, I always say that since the day I came to this country and I came to Toronto, I only felt support and solidarity support and solidarity. And I start realizing what the word solidarity really meant. I remember that I was walking around on the street, blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden we start getting together with all this group of people, Canadian people. John Foster was there all the time, all the time, all the time. I remember even a party in your house, John Foster. I, Beautiful <laughs> welcome that you gave us. And uh, I remember each face, I all maybe the names, I, I don't remember very well, but the faces, I remember each of them, each of them. And I have the opportunity to say this for the memorial of Bob Carty. Bob Carty, talking about culture, about culture and this solidarity, that was. Well, I came here with a guitar. My father, when I left Chile, he gave me a guitar and he said, son, you are going to need this. I don't know if it was a premonition, whatever, but I used to sing all the time, but only just, uh, and I took the guitar and I came to Cana and since the first day and start singing, playing, there were always activities, Friday, Saturday, every single week an activity where Canadians were welcoming. And I remember this Canadian singer, he was a journalist and an activist, Bob Carty, singing a song by Victor Jara, Chilean composer, and I said, what the heck is this, where I am? He's singing in Spanish, and, and that was what was happening at that time. And, and as I told you, I remember each of these phase, I was all the time with somebody, I felt with somebody with me, telling me where to go and telling me that you are not alone. You are not by yourself. 
we are all with you, all with you. I remember each activity, each activity. The other thing that called my attention was the multiculturalism of this country. That was for me a surprise. Like in Chile, well, they were all Chileans. And uh, if you see somebody who was uh, from another country where people from embassies or diplomatic stuff like that, but it wasn't an immigration, even though my grandfather was from the Basque country, there is a flag there, that from the Basque country in France, in the, well, he hated that, but in the French part, and uh, the immigration was different, it was absolutely here, you could see different group of people. So in every activity that we had, always there were Canadian people singing, I was singing, uh, people from Uruguay, people from Argentina. I don't know, always we got together. We were a few, just a few people who sang and we were always the same people everywhere in all the uh, solidarity peñas or solidarity events, events that we, that we had. That was for me amazing. And this started growing and growing. And at the beginning, there was a Chilean group called Victor, Victor Hara Dance Group. Some Canadians were also dancing Chilean, Chilean dances there in that group. And I remember we were invited in 1975 to Sudbury by, uh, I think it was John Kujek, who was an activist from, uh, from Sudbury. And uh, we were invited there to play in the... Uh, it was the auditorium of the union the, of the miners there. And it was a really, really nice event. I didn't speak a word in English. That was the other thing, a word in English. And uh, that was a little bit hard. But for some reason, we understood each other all the time, all the time. That was really hard. That was really hard. Probably I understood the 2% of all the activities and all the uh, speeches or stuff like that. And we kept going and going and our uh, communication, our relationship, our uh, convivence was growing and growing. And as we were playing music, we get with more people. We get with more people. I, I remember to do some work with the uh, Nancy White, uh, there was another group called Bread and Roses, another, uh, what was his name? I have it somewhere here. Uh, what was his name? Uh, well, but David Deloney, he was a piano player, really nice. And we got all together and I remember there were two places that I remember, St. Paul Trinity Church, St. Paul Church, 121 Avenue Road, and uh, the other was at the first Unitarian church on St. Clair and Avenue Road. I remember that uh, those two places mainly, and uh, always we had activities there. We did a play uh, by Canadian people uh, based uh, in a, a book in a book by Pablo Nerua. A Splendor and Dead of Joaquin Murillo. That it was a beautiful play with Canadians and Latin American actors. Beautiful, beautiful. This kind of relationship we had. And uh, I, did the, I did the music with some other people, eh, eh, Canadians and Chileans and other, from other nationalities again. And as I told you, right there, there was a group of people singing, eh, a friend, Heather Chain of Queen, used to sing in that group after uh, we met her and she married one of my friends. She started singing with us and everything started going and going with Nancy White. We did a lot of work. She did a lot of work. Is a person that we have to remember all the time, not only for her music in about Canada, about Canadian politics, about Canadian situation. She wrote songs from Argentina, from Chile, from Chile, for Chile, for Central America. 
many, many. She translates songs by Violeta Parra, by Victor Jara. She translate, translated many of my songs that we used to sing together. These kind of things were developed at that time. So that solidarity, it was always with us. And we are very thankful all the time for that. You people not only open your arms for us, but you open also your hearts. And that one will be always over here, over here in my heart and in our heart. I think I speak on behalf of everybody, not only on behalf of me. So things start growing, things start growing. And you know, after we made a group with Greeks, even though the group was with Greeks, we kept working with Nancy White, we kept working with this, we sang in English, we sang in Greek, and uh, we were with Mexicans, we were, uh, there was a string band, I remember, with Marilyn Hammond, uh, Wendolyn McEwen was working with us, reading poetry, many, many people, and that was solidarity, that was a solidarity that I remember. The first days, I can't speak about the first day, and I feel only a happiness, happiness and solidarity, solidarity and support and support. Mr. John Foster, I remember all my life, all my life. You were one of those people that we have to thank and you were always around here, around us, always working for us. I have I have like 12 binders with posters and stuff like that. I have one here from Georgia Univer. You are in most of them as a speaker. Lisa also, I have one, a, one around here, one the program about Latin America from 1977. There it is, Lisa North also speaking. And Joe Foster, you were all the time, all the time. And I was reading the chats, many people from that, that time, eh? Louis Castleman, I don't know, like Lee Murray, many people. I think I'm, I'm talking too much, uh, Bianca, eh? No? No, I, we're, en we're enjoying this. Sorry? I, just, <laughs> I like telling stories. That's, my, that's what I do. That's what I do. I turn my stories into music, into songs. So that is the music that I that I sing about. But that is mainly what I wanted to say. I have all these uh, uh, all these memories, and we worked so much in theater plays. And uh, we went. I used to go to the uh, Mackenzie Papineau Brigade to sing. That was something something that uh, oh my heart and uh, my mind was I, I didn't know about that. I didn't know about the Sp uh, Canadian people who went to fight to the Spanish Civil War. I didn't know that. And when I they invited me to this uh, Mackenzie Papineau Brigade to play, yeah, sure, I read about, oh my God, this is... And I could see those people, they are all sitting, uh, men and women, men and women, not only men, telling all their story. For me was such an example, such an example of, of braveness, such an example of, of solidarity again, solidarity to go to another country to fight for the freedom of that country. Oh, it was amazing. So we used to play songs from from Spain, from Spain, songs from Chile. The, there was a woman, uh, she was a nurse, I, I remember, and she used to sing some uh, flamenco. I tried to play flamenco, but it was, we had fun. We, and I remember all of them. I can see all of them sitting down on the stage and hundreds of people uh, supporting them and clapping them and looking at them with, such proudness, very proud of, of what they did, of what they did. Okay, I think I'm talking too much, Bianca. Thank you very much to all of you. I'm very happy to say what I had to say. I'm very happy to be part of this.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Marcelo. Uh, really beautiful to hear about the community, the music, the events, no doubt a really big part of the puzzle regarding why this movement was so powerful, so effective, so collaborative, um, and really moved by the, really by the love that you describe. You painted such a vivid picture and um, you certainly captured my imagination. I'm looking very forward to hearing more from you in the Q&A. The next speaker of the evening is Veronica Schild. Uh, Veronica was born and raised in Chile. Um, she's a professor emeritus of political science at the University of Western Ontario. Most recently, she's held various visiting professor positions at Chilean universities and also in the graduate program of the Latin America Institute Frey Universitat Berlin. Welcome, Veronica. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And hello, everyone. Um, I know some of you and some of you I know of. <laughs> so it's a real privilege to be able to join this space with you. And I have to thank Lisa North for roping me into the collection. <laughs> uh, I am, as I explained in my little contribution to the book, I am a latecomer to the Chilean um, solidarity and um, exile community in Toronto. I am not an exile. I left Chile in 1971 as a young teenager with uh, my mother for other reasons uh, to do with what I would call now gender politics and, you know, the inability to get away from abusive situations for women. Um, so I came here in 1979. And in my case, it is the Chilean um, solidarity, the academic solidarity of um, uh, Chileans and Canadians working with the Chile project and at CERLAC at, the, at York University that actually enabled me to go back to Chile. Uh, so I returned in 1986 to Chile during the dictatorship to do research. But I, and I explained that in my little uh, blurb, I, even though I did not stay, I spent two years in Chile. I ultimately came back to Canada and subsequently had a, an academic career here, which I have devoted to basically attempting to understand what exactly has happened in Chile and not just, uh, you know, until 1973, but from 1990 onwards. So that has been the focus of my life, really. And, um, uh, but I just wanna say a couple of things. One of them is how, when I came to Toronto from Washington DC, where I had lived, uh, I entered into a world that I did not think imaginable, where you know you could take courses on Marx at the Marx Institute in Toronto, where uh, you know I studied critical theory. I was not intending to be a political scientist. I studied critical theory, which included feminists, and they were also activists. So we were out on the streets uh, for March eighth and for Labor Day demonstrations. So. It was a world of activism and solidarity that I had really not experienced. And among that those uh, that world, there were my peers at OISI who were people who had left Chile and who were um, either getting, you know, their teaching uh, certificates again or, uh, you know, revalidating their own um, their, their own training in Chile, because as we know, if you know, uh, among the many dimensions, it is not it was not easy for acad for academics and for professionals to insert themselves in the Canadian context. Quite tough, actually, without the proper credentials. So I entered that world, uh, and of course, uh, Marcelo, that's where I met you in the Trojan horse, because of course I was also. A, a, a sidua regular of the Trojan horse, right? Uh, so it was it was a very special place, and it is one place where my uh, desire, which I had had since 1971 to return to Chile, uh, was really cemented. So I left precisely. I left OICI and I left philosophy to move into a kind of context that allowed me to go back to Chile. 
And to study, uh, I ended up studying and meeting people in poblaciones, which was not easy at the time. Uh, and the contacts that I received from fellow um, students, especially Polo Diaz, uh, you know, who's now emeritus from Regina, University of Regina, uh, were incredibly uh, helpful, very, very helpful, even though at the end I struck, uh, you know, on my own. But I just, because I, I uh, Chile for me has become, as I said, not only, um, you know, this, this source of never ending attachment, um, but also, an, you know, a kind of an, an intellectual and academic uh, uh, obsession. <laughs> um, I would like to raise at the 50th anniversary, I would like to raise a couple of, of issues and um, they go in the direction of what John Foster has already mentioned, the context. And here I am, you know, I'm thinking about um, the line that was, you know, facilitated to me by my partner, Malcolm Blinko, anthropologist from York, from Evgeny Evstushenko, the um, Russian dissident poet, who said, when truth is replaced by silence, the silence is a lie. And when reading the, which I had not known about, the uh, messages of the Canadian ambassador, Andrew Ross, uh, that he was sending to Ottawa, I was struck by a couple of comments. One of them, uh, you know, which was already uh, quoted by Bianca, about the riffraff of Latin America, uh, you know, having ended up in Chile. But second, how he observes in one of his messages after really minimizing human rights violations, uh, how he observes that in fact, the security forces were using what he called Nazi-like, uh, you know, uh, brutality in the handling of prisoners. And I thought to myself, you know, and of course he dismiss, he says basically in another comment, well, this is kind of the, the Latin American way, you know, this is how Latin Americans do it. And I thought to myself, really, uh, being a member of that older Marcelo uh, immigration to Chile on my father's side, the German side, uh, I have been uh, very careful about studying the Nazi connection with Chile. And what we don't mention, what doesn't get mentioned here is that it wasn't just, and I think at the 50th anniversary, we need to come to terms with this as part of the Cold War. It wasn't only the CIA <laughs> and it wasn't only the Americans. It was also uh, the German security forces, the Israeli security forces, uh, the you know British, the French, uh, who were actually facilitating the movement of former Nazis to Chile and other parts, so that the DINA, the Secret Service in Chile, uh, you know the most brutal in it, in terms of torture and human rights abuses had uh, Walter Rauf, who is, you know, uh, who was never, able, they were never able to extradite him from Chile. Extradite him from Chile. He died of old age uh, in, in, Santiago, in Chile, in Las Condes, in Santiago, but he was recruited. He was enabled to leave Europe, even though he is the person in charge of masterminding and inventing the mobile gas chambers and handling sarin gas. And he used this knowledge to provide a kind of sophisticated, and he called it final solution to disappear Chilean prisoners. So, you know, I would like to leave this with you as part of the context it, because we are at a moment in which democracy is being uh, eroded everywhere. And although it is very hard rendering to watch the nunca mas, I agree with you, Joe, uh, it is also heartbreaking to see what is happening in this commemoration in Chile today, which is 
today, uh, there is a denial on the part of the right, most of the right, of a, a minimizing of the military dictatorship, of the military coup, arguing openly that it was necessary, and or even saying that, you know, human rights violations uh, are, you know, were, well, they happened, but they were not really associated with the coup. They happened later, right? And in fact, one person said in parliament this last week, a woman, that, you know, sexual, the idea that sexual abuse was used as a form of torture in Chile was an urban myth, something that has been proven by the United Nations and the couple of commissions in Chile. So I leave you with that because I think we need to continue with this kind of solidarity. And we need to also think about the Canadian dimension, which is repeated today in the handling, the differential handling of refugees from different parts of the world, right? Just as then, they are not today all the same. Right, in terms of our own prejudices. They may not be connected to the Cold War now, but they're connected to other things. So this is, I, for me, at the 50th anniversary and the Canadian connection, this is what I would like to rescue as part of my intervention today. So thank you very much once again, and uh, I look forward to questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Veronica. Um, thank you for sharing your perspective, um, for bringing in that Canadian connection, very important. Um, also for highlighting the international historical perspective um, and also bringing in some of the harrowing context and highlighting the minimizing of the horrors that were experienced. It's, this is very important to, to bring to all of our attention. And also just um, very grateful to you for your dedication to these issues um, over the years. Um, and we'll hear more from you in the Q&A. And I do want to just remind people to put your questions in the Q&A box if you do have something that you would like to ask or know from panelists. All right, so our last uh, speaker of the evening is uh, Magdalena Ugarte. Magdalena is Assistant Professor in the School of Urban and Regional Planning at Toronto Metropolitan University. Her work examines the relationship between planning, settler colonialism, and other forms of institutionalized dispossession. Since 2014, she's worked with Mapuche partners in Chile regarding questions of Mapuche planning, law, and territorial reconstruction. Her doctoral research about the implementation of the duty to consult with Indigenous peoples in Chile received the Barclay Gibbs Jones Award for Best Dissertation in Planning of the Associate College at Schools of Planning Canada. Welcome, Magdalena. Thank you so much, uh, Bianca and all the organizers uh, of the webinar. Uh, and thank you to Lisa, of course, for uh, bringing us together and to all the contributors. It's great to be here tonight. And, and it's very significant to be here marking the 50th um, year anniversary of the coup in Chile. And I think in particular observe, like, like Veronica was saying, uh, how certain realities have changed in important ways and uh, since that time, since that brutal disruption of the institutional democratic order and also um, of respect for human rights, while other realities um, remain substantially unchanged, uh, which I think it's kind of maybe a part of sort of, to see those continuities. So similar to Veronica, I'm a latecomer, I'm not an exile, uh, but rather someone who, who's worked for the past decade uh, around indigenous rights in Chile, which is my connection uh, to the book. I've been in Canada for 15 years now. Uh, so the, this concluding chapter of the book uh, was written with my colleague, Victor Canunir Railaf, uh, who unfortunately couldn't be here this evening. Uh, he's a Mapuche anthropologist who works at Universidad de la Frontera. And he's also a member um, of the Mapuche Association of Research um, and Development. Um, so briefly, maybe for, for people who, who are in the process of getting the book before you get it. Uh, so this concluding chapter explores a very particular expression, perhaps, of the solidarity efforts between Canada and Chile in the aftermath of the coup, and specifically um, the solidarities that occur around Indigenous rights, and more specifically an observation and fact-finding mission 
to Chile that was led by the Canadian Interchurch Committee on Human Rights in Latin America late um, in the 70s, in 1979. Um, so this mission specifically sought to visibilize the impacts of a widely criticized law and known as Decree Law 2568, also known as the Indigenous Law, that was enacted by the Pinochet regime in 79 in order to divide community-held uh, community uh, Mapuche lands and stripping those lands of indigenous status, bringing them into the market through individual property regime mechanisms. Uh, and the mission, of course, also wanted to assess the state of Mapuche rights violations uh, more broadly in a context where lots of the international attention was going to human rights violation broadly, this commission, this mission really brought attention and shed light uh, to the particularity of um, indigenous and Mapuche um, rights. Uh, so a number of things that we tried to highlight with Victor in the in the um, in that short chapter, uh, well, the, this mission was composed of, of one really internationally renowned, renowned indigenous leader, uh, George Manuel. Um, who really brought and made really significant the presence of that mission in Chile in the sense of his ability to, to see and compare and establish connections between what was unfolding on Mapuche territory and other places where there's settler colonialism, such as here in Canada, actually, and, ever, and other places. Uh, and then three religious delegates, uh, John Hilburn, Mar uh, Marc Lapierre, and Simon Smith, um, and, and something that, that it's really interesting with looking at the archives, it's how sharp that mission was in really denouncing the political situation at the time. And in particular, this transition from the most, uh, the more overt violence of the initial years to how that transition into policy changes that criminalize under, under softer veils, perhaps, um, any actions that run against government plans, including indigenous mobilization. Uh, but more specifically, thinking about Mapuche rights and land rights, uh, the commission really sharply denounced how the division of Mapuche lands was actually a first step towards the dissolution of Mapuche identity, because by a, um, stripping land, indigenous lands of indigenous status, basically indigenous identity was gonna disappear. So highly as assimilationist approach. Uh, but then also how at an institutional level, the dissolution of certain institutions like the Indigenous Development Institute, for instance, and the transfer of indigenous rights to kind of siloed institutions like those responsible for healthcare or education, et cetera, was really negate, negating Mapuche's unique status. So overall uh, this mission shed light and broad visibility to how this law was opening the door to the transnationalization of agriculture, uh, but also denouncing its underlying economic and uh, assimilationist drivers. So in, in the chapter, in a way, we try to do kind of a number of things. One, it's examine the, the relevance of that mission and the findings and, and such an important solidarity effort, the impact it had. But then also really importantly highlighting some of the continuities, which I think Veronica really clearly uh, highlighted now, but then other uh, speakers this evening, uh, because this law here was one in a lineage of policies, indigenous policies that have consistently in Chile and similar things happen even here in Canada, try to take uh, over Mapuche lands, negate Mapuche sovereignty and political authority, and generally assimilate Mapuche and other indigenous peoples through nationalist agendas that are homogenizing. Um, and, and also we try to show some of the resonances with even what was happening here in Canada, when for instance, Prime Minister uh, Pierre Trudeau at the time tried to pass the white paper that sought to abolish the Indian Act or later attempts to turn um, indigenous reserve lands into uh, fee simple lands. Um, and then some of the my fellow speakers here have also pointed to these connections with the Canadian corporate sector. So in a way, try, showing with the archives show um, how there's maybe this other regressive side to complicity or solidarity in this case, not the progressive solidarity of uh, supporting or receiving exiles people, for instance, here, but actually the complicity of the Canadian business sector, particularly in forestry, really pushing to advance um, making lands and bringing them indigenous lands uh, 
that are highly rich and fertile and in strategic locations into market systems. Um, so in a way, that's a really brief kind of high level overview of the chapter. So in general terms, uh, we, we really want to highlight how this fact-finding mission was a really powerful exercise in North-South solidarity regarding indigenous rights, a really powerful awareness raising mechanism, uh, particularly regarding indigenous rights at a time where human rights more broadly were being uh, perhaps paid attention, but not the specificity of indigenous rights. Uh, but also to leave you maybe with the question of, well, more than, well, five decades uh, after the coup, more than four decades after this particular mission and report uh, were released, um, the findings really uh, raise important questions about the extent to which the end of the formal dictatorship has meant any substantial gains for Mapuche, territorial, political, cultural rights, and self-determination. Uh, and it's also a really powerful reminder of the need to keep building alliances and uh, denouncing and challenging uh, the different forms of internal colonialism across the continent um, and keep pushing for, for everything that has not really changed in these 50 years. So with that, looking forward to the Q&A and thanks again for, for the invitation to join. Thank you, thank you so much um, for that overview and, um, and for making the connections to indigenous struggles, um, both in Chile and in Canada, corporate complicity. Um, these are all very, very important things that we need to be uh, thinking about um, and very important connections as well. So thank you for concluding our discussion, Magdalena. Um, we're now going to be moving on to the Q&A uh, session with audience members. We don't have too much uh, time, um, but we're going to take a couple of questions, um, encourage our panelists to just jump right in. Um, so the first question that we have that was submitted in advance is, what similarities or differences do you see in Canadian policy towards Chile and Latin America today uh, versus 50 years ago? Pretty, pretty broad question. Um, is there anyone that would like to, to take a, a stab at that? Um, the policies today versus policies uh, in the 70s. All right, I, I might have to call on someone. Laura, go ahead. Well, I'll just take a stab at it. And again, emphasizing I'm not a Chileanist. Um, but, I, you know, there are certainly commonalities in terms of corporate interests um, and, and successive governments uh, dedication uh, on, on the Canadian side, dedication to promoting the rights of Canadian based corporations uh, who are extracting resources from the region um, and their unwillingness to um, examine uh, the operations of those corporations uh, based on standards of democracy and human rights. Um, that's just one commonality. I, and um, Magdalena did an amazing job of talking about uh, indigenous issues, which in many ways have not changed. Thank you very much. And, and that's a wonderful section of the book. Um, but, you know, a lot has changed. I think the role of the U.S. in the region has really declined dramatically. I really appreciate Veronica pointing out it wasn't just the U.S. We tend, you know, those of us anti-imperialists tend to exaggerate the role of the U.S. at all times. Um, but especially today, the United States is, is a much, much less important actor. We have other actors in the region like China, um, you know, uh, so that really shifts the name of the game. Uh, you know, there are Cold War things going on in a sense, but uh, I think countries like Chile have a lot more capacity to assert themselves on the global stage than they had in the in the early 1970s. Um, and Canada's role, I think, you know, Canada has kept trying to especially under the Harper government, was trying to say, well, Canada can play a really important role in the region, um, but I think our, our, uh, our role has declined over time, our importance has declined over time, uh, given the rise of these other actors. So that's sort of an overview of it from an international relations kind of perspective. 
Thank you, Laura. Magdalena, did you want to jump in there? I, I don't know. I think Laura did a, a great job. And also, I think compared to some of my other fellow speakers here, uh, I mean, I was born during the dictatorship, but during the second half of it, uh, I was not able to observe like in firsthand kind of some of the things that unfolded back in the 70s, for instance, but totally echoing what uh, Laura was saying. I think the the everything that relates to economic policy, my, my the impression I get, and it might not only be Canada, but it's um, I, I think everything's now happening through that lens, perhaps more explicitly than before. I think even the fact that, I don't know, that here the Canadian uh, CEDA, like what used to be the, um, the Canadian International Development Agency was eventually stripped and then transfer, transferred into foreign affairs and economic policy with a very open kind of discourse around, we give money to countries to the extent that our business interests are there and they're being served, that kind of thing, it's maybe a bit more blatant today than it was in the past. I think the continuity exists. Uh, but but and even when we think about immigration, I know many of the comments here, and, and this is not only to the Chilean case, but Canadian immigration being, of course, comparatively way more uh, open, even up to this day, and we're more humane. In so many ways, we see a very, very clear stratification, and it's basically economic migration, and we see temporary workers from Central America coming for decades and never being granted um, permanent residence or the ability to bring their family, same with Filipino workers. So we see kind of these, these tensions unfolding, I think, more, more visibly, uh, perhaps than before. Um, well, at the same time, well, things are always kind of relative, right? And, and if we take as a comparison, I don't know, some other countries, Canada, it's in a stronger position, but I think it needs to also be assessed in relation to itself or what it could be, right? And in that sense, I think the prevalence of economic policy and imperatives, uh, it's a pretty, um, it's a continuity that I think has exacerbated. Yeah. Um, Laura, you touched upon the Cold War dynamics. There's a question here um, from a participant. It says, Chile seemed to suffer from Cold War dynamics. Today, a new Cold War appears to be forming West versus BRIC nations. New repression in Nicaragua may be an expression on forming tensions. What lessons from the Chilean resistance might apply, uh, asks this participant. Any thoughts on that? What can, what can be learned? All right, I'll uh, I'll put that I'll put that question on the back burner. Um, I have a question here from David that's specifically for Veronica. Um, Veronica, could you elaborate on something you mentioned briefly, the role of Israel in repression in Chile and elsewhere? Um, I'm reminded of the publication by um, an international Jewish anti-Zionist network, uh, Israel's worldwide role in repression. Do you? Uh, yeah, is, uh, could you elaborate a little bit, Veronica? Uh, well, uh, I don't really know specifically about the larger role, I mean, other than what anybody reading, you know, these texts would, but uh, I do know that from Israeli sources who've published in uh, Haaretz and the Jer Jerusalem Post, for example, uh, that there was a really a blind eye turned after the Second World War so that uh, you know, people with criminal backgrounds, Nazis with criminal backgrounds were actually recruited for the Cold War effort to spy, uh, you know, to participate in the, uh, in the uh, you know, keeping an eye on the, on the Soviet Union and the spread of communism throughout, uh, you know, throughout, especially in Latin America. So that's what I, that's as far as I can elaborate. And the case, the specific case of Walter Rauf is uh, quite, quite significant because uh, as I mentioned, he was, his exit from uh, Europe was facilitated by the Israelis um, security force forces, right? And then his move to uh, Quito, Ecuador, and then in Ecuador for, to Chile. So he did not go to Argentina. He went directly from Ecuador to Chile. And then he was recruited by the DINA, the you know notorious uh, secret police um, service in Chile, 
right? So the, the connection that is made by some Israeli uh, writers is about the larger role of Mossad in the Cold War effort in allying itself with this with the West, despite you know the the claims to be actually after protecting um, you know basically Jewish people after this horror of the Second World War and the Holocaust. So that's what I wanted to emphasize. Uh, and Laura, yes, you know, is that in you know the Americans may have provided the school of the Americas. And not not only to train the military. I mean, Martha Higgins has a very interesting old book by now on how even the police was trained. But it is, you know, the German uh, te technology as used by the Nazi, uh, you know, human rights violators and mass murderers that gets recruited by the DINA uh, to develop not only the Chilean uh, extermination process, which was called the final solution. I mean, this is the horrible thing, but also Operation Condor. So the idea that, you know, the I don't know if you know about this, but that you had then from Chile, the initiative that all security secret services in Argentina in the region would be together, uh, keeping an eye not only on people in Latin America to dispose of them, but also in uh, other parts of the world, in the United States, wherever they were posing a threat to you know, the stability of the regime, right? So all of that we owe to this collaborative effort and high technical knowledge in the elimination of human beings. And still we don't talk about, we don't put the two and two together. So the Germans write about Walter Rauch, and there's a very interesting documentary for those of you who speak German, in the Westdeutsche Rundfunk, which came out this week, an hour long audio with interviews in Chile. So they study that, Americans and Canadians study the CIA, and the French study the French, the guy who taught methods that he learned in Algeria. Do you know what I mean? So at the at, at 50th anniversary, we should just spell it out and, and draw some connections because I think it's not over. As I said, there is this larger picture of geostrategic interests where, you know, we have peculiar bedfellows coming together and learning from each other. Thank you, Veronica. Kathleen wants to know how many of the neoliberal fascist laws, policies, et cetera, introduced by Pinochet have been dismantled by more recent governments? And maybe I'll bundle that together with Robert's question who wants to know uh, whether the attempt to draft a new constitution for Chile was too ambitious. So how, how, how have successive governments done uh, when it comes to dismantling uh, some of those, those policies uh, and attitudes? Um, Marcelo. Oh, hold on, you're still on mute. Well, this thing about the constitution, I, I don't know what's, well, I know what's happening, to be honest. There was a very democratic way, a very democratic way of write a constitution in Chile, a new constitution. We used to have the con constitution written by Pinochet and a group of people, very few people, of course, that belonged to the dictatorship. They wrote that constitution that it's until today. Well, after the protest, the social movement that was in uh, 2019, uh, they call it plebiscite and they decided to create this new constitution. There were elections of who were going to be, who were going to write that constitution and they wrote a, well there was a same amount of women same amount of men a, there were representatives of the native people in chile in from all the regions of chile many many good things they wrote a really amazing constitution but the thing is this the thing is this the right wing people, the 
powerful people, they had the uh, minority, how do you say, the minority in this, uh, uh, in this constitution. So decided, they decided that it was not a constitution for everybody. And what it means is that for these people, the a constitution for everybody is the constitution for them. It's a constitution that they don't take away their rights. And in this constitution, there were, were many things that uh, took away some, uh, I don't know, the water, the property of the water, uh, many things, many things, the property of the mines, the corporate property of the minerals, all our natural resources. And what happened? They reject this constitution. They decided to create another one. Another people were going to write this. And what happened is that now, the new constitution that they are not approving yet, it is a, what is the command that it is a direct disease written by the ultra right people, the Republicanos, ultra right people. And you can imagine what they approved a few days ago in this committee. Everything that was written in favor of the people now it was, it is, it, it will disappear from that constitution. And that what is happening now with this, I don't know where this is going to end, but the right, the right, I mean the right wing people, the powerful people, they don't stop until they have all their uh, rights back, all their privilege back. That is what's happening. That's why the coup, that's why this, that's why that. That is the situation what I think. They don't, they are not easy people. They don't believe in social things. They don't believe in the people. They don't believe in the support of the people. They believe in themselves, their money, their properties, their company. That's it. That's all they uh, they care about. That's all they care about. That's all I, I can say. It's not something pessimistic, but it's a reality. It's a reality. I really hope that something else is going to happen, but I'm not so sure about that. That is my only concern. I'm not so sure. These people are very tricky. Do you think they care about the 50 years of the coup? They don't, they don't. I was watching the Chilean TV this morning. They don't, they don't care about this. Everything was right, the coup was right. Now they say, oh no, we human rights, I say different things. We don't agree with that. No, they agree with that. They don't agree on TV, they don't agree on the radio, but in their houses, they agree with that. Those are these people who are, uh, who has the power, the power, because the power is not the president, it's not the, the power are them, are them, the money, the money. That's it. I'm getting upset, so we're going to leave it there. All right, so speaking of power, let, uh, let's uh, turn it around and talk about different types of power. Um, we don't have any more time. We're pretty much out, so I'm just going to take one last question from Alejandro, who wants to know, um, his question is actually specifically for John. Um, he wants to know what words of wisdom advice can you share to a new generation facing the resurgence of authoritarianism, fascism? And then also I would uh, ask to all the panelists, in addition to this, um, what, what could solidarity with uh, Chile look like today? Um, so John, um, words of advice uh, to, to, to this generation. Um, who are who are facing much uh, resurgence of authoritarianism, fascism, et cetera, and uh, and how people can get involved. What can people do today? Mm 
I am I being heard? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I would have to admit I have no magic answers in this regard, and I'm uh, about two months out of touch with the sources of of answers, which were um, on a daily basis my students and. I, in terms of, of where I would look at, and engage, and perhaps you have something to tell me, when we were, happened in the 70s, and Joe was doing his list of, um, of what do we learn, or what should we learn, or where should we inquire, uh, one of the things that struck me um, at the time and in comparison with now had to do with, with uh, the relationship between activists and the media and the control of the media and of control of communication. And I guess that's where I put my, my question marks at the moment because it strikes me that major shifts uh, in the elements that really control or, or claim to control public dialogue are occurring extremely rapidly. I feel behind it, out of touch with it, uh, but perceiving from a distance, and maybe this is a, a rather negative intervention, but it's where I would look, look for challenges and positive change. When I go back to the very first voice I mentioned uh, in this uh, in this session, back to our our friend Flory, who spoke basically to Canada on the national radio network at a time of the day when many people were listening, and uh, which uh, people from the Latin group are involved with, and particularly Tim Drayman, but the, the um, leap, in a sense, streets, living rooms, and uh, auto. Oh, John, I'm afraid you're, coming, you're really coming out for us. It's, it's and, and, speaking of communication, challenge. So maybe I'll stop there because there's yeah, I'm afraid we just can't really hear you anymore. Yeah, we could hear the beginning, but but not anymore. Thank you, though. Um, Joe, I haven't heard much from you. Maybe we can get some concluding comments from you uh, around this question of uh, continued solidarity. Well, let me throw, from my point of view, the, the key area of work with uh, solidarity with Chile right now would be around extractive industries. There are big fights in Chile around water, who controls water. Uh, there are, as people have mentioned on the panel and in the chat, issues around uh, Mapuche rights, uh, rights of people from uh, Isla de Pascua and so on. But, you know, the big Canadian mining firms or those that are supposedly listed on the T TSX but aren't really Canadian, perhaps, uh, tech mines wanting to open the biggest copper mine that Chile has seen and so on and so on, those are directly responsible to us. And we do not have in this country the control over uh, this that we were promised in 2018 to have an ombudsperson to look at extractives in Canada. We got Sherry Meyerhoff's uh, appointment in 2019 as the Canadian Ombudsman for Responsible Enterprise, and she has not looked at any of these issues. She doesn't have the power to. Her interim report recently was just on uh, companies in China producing uh, uh, clothing, you know, textiles, but we're not we're not at all addressing those major questions around the extractive industries in many countries of the world. And Chile, of course, is a big place for as is the Ring of Fire and so on uh, in our own country. But the, the 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 lack of control over Canadian corporate structure is something that we have to come back to. I think uh, very very strongly as a lesson from uh, I the role that I T and T. Uh, played in the, the Chilean coup, for example, that uh, this is key. So corporate power, uh, 
we have to have our own house in order in Canada to be able to uh, make sure that our, our companies operating overseas are, are doing that ethically. Veronica. Let me add uh, uh, very quickly something because I fully agree with, uh, with Joe's comments. And there is something that we can do in terms of solidarity here with relation to water. Because at least in 2018, before the pandemic, when I visited the north, uh, you know, sort of north of Santiago, an area uh, where I learned from the activists there that it isn't just because of mining act activism and extractivism, rather, that we should be involved uh, in solidarity, but because our own pension plans own part of the water in Chile. So, you know, let's not just focus exclusively on mining, which is absolutely critical today. But, you know, the Chile, somebody asked before the question, what has changed? Well, there is a lot in common because there is a, a world in which everyone now can purchase, you know, uh, the water, the light, this, the, 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 the highways, etc. So, you know, we have uh, investments among the Ontario Teachers Pension Board, at least in 2018, it was up to 40 percent of water in Chile. And our Canadian pension plan is also invested, right? So there are many, many opportunities to uh, engage. And so solidarity has become much more complex, I would say, because there are environmental issues, indigenous issues, all of them to do with the kind of neoliberal capitalism we live in, right? Which has opened up opportunities for investments in just about everything. So that's what I would say. <laughs> it was definitely wild time. So wise words from uh, from both of you and um, and from everybody, and a challenge as well to hold um, our power players accountable. Um, we have run out of time. Um, it's been an excellent discussion. Um, I can see from the chat that our audience have, at home have. Uh, enjoyed it thoroughly and we've all learned a lot. I want to thank you panelists for your excellent presentations, um, for your responses. I want to encourage people to get their hands on uh, a copy of Canada Chile Solidarity 1973 to 1990. It's available for pre-order at Novalis Books, uh, novalis.ca. And I just want to encourage everyone to stay informed, uh, stay engaged, um, solidarity with Chile. And uh, that's it for our program. Uh, good evening. Thanks, everybody.